Right, good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? Thanks for uh, <clears throat> thanks for hanging out with me for the next 45 minutes. So, uh, like always, a little bit of um, I assume everybody can hear me. Okay, good. I'm on a different. Um, I'm on a slightly different internet connection to my normal, so I hope it's adequate. I expect it to be. All right, so today we are going to talk about. Um, today I want to talk about sort of your daily trading procedure and what one should look for, um, and what one should look for going into the day, or at least said differently. I don't know if there's a right or wrong method for things, but <clears throat> kind of how I start my day. Um, and try to cover all bases and formulate a plan going into the day. So I'm all about routine <clears throat> because of things. The reason why I like to have a routine and, and sort of a standard way of doing things is to give one a baseline for what you're doing as far as your trading. Good morning, Medhead. Because if, you're, if you have a baseline in your trading, then you've covered or in your analysis – then if things are working well, money did. If things are working well, then you can continue to do those things. If things are not working well, then at least you have a standard operating procedure to adjust things from. But if you're all over the map, then you don't really have a decent baseline to work from. All right. So that's my thinking in terms of a routine be reasonably systematic about what you're doing. Obviously, this is a dynamic, moving beast, and <clears throat> you need to be able to be flexible with it, but there has to be a skeleton of um, sort of a skeleton of procedure that one goes through, I think, is what I'm trying to get at. All right, so what is that procedure? For myself, I start trading that start my day, obviously I'll have a look at things in Asia, but I start my day around 9.30 p.m. my time on the west coast of the United States, which is approximately 5.30 in the morning London time. And then I prepare my trading day for the London Open, which is at 8 a.m. London, midnight for myself, 3 a.m. on the east coast. All right, and then it kind of just filters through from there, it's not the most ideal trading session, but such is life. If you like water, you should not live in California. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> we just don't seem to get any of that anymore. But <clears throat> so first things first for myself is obviously <clears throat> if you're tired, grab some coffee. But I like to just do a um, – I like to sort of just do a superficial reading of what's happened prior to myself getting there. All right, so that may consist of, um, in my case, I've got Trade the News. So I'll look at the Trade the News summaries of the Asian session, of the late New York session. I'll um, maybe read Yahoo Finance. I mean, anything that looks anything that looks interesting, and it's not necessarily – it's not necessary to even gain a ton of information because it's all news, right? It's all come and gone. However, what it does is it puts one in the frame of mind of, okay, it's work time, all right? You go from uh, – because trading is very different to real life. You go from, you know, making spaghetti and meatballs for dinner, and then you have to all of a sudden start trading. So I find that just reading economic stuff puts one in that frame of mind, all right? Now – you don't want to do so much in-depth fundamental analysis at this point that one is clouding your judgment by opinion right out the gate. Okay, I made the mistake the other day of turning on CNBC and listening, and because I had nothing else going on in the background, and I got about 17 different opinions on the Fed, and I had all my conviction that I thought I had all of a sudden became, well, hang on a minute. So I had to quickly backtrack there and turn all that off because one owns, an, one's own analysis 
is by far and away the best. By far and away. Because you're the only one that has to trade that information. So if you have other people's thoughts in your mind, they'd, you'd better have a way of tuning that out or at least making it... Um, or at least making it uh, sort of complementary to what you're thinking. In other words, a dissenting voice that you can tune in and tune out when you feel applicable, and you have to have the conviction to be able to do that. I think that comes with experience. Rick Santelli likes to drop the drama on you, though. He'll drama you up. He's there in the pits, and he's got people screaming in his ear. Good, yeah. Okay, so, <clears throat> light reading, number one for me. Right. Then number two is, I like to look and see, basically, what Asia's done, right? And what late New York has done, because a lot of times, you're simply going to do what everybody else has been doing, all right? And that's that's very self-explanatory, right? You just, I mean, I have, in my case, I have a screen that looks like this. Um you know, it's kind of split like this, and it's got six charts in it. It actually is rectangular. It's not the... Oh, okay. Where to get that handle? I'll just do it like this. Very rough freehand here. Okay, and I'll have Euro-Dollar... Euro dollar, pound, Aussie, <clears throat> Euro yen, uh, USD yen, and say Euro Aussie or whatever floats your boat. Okay, and the point here is, and these are 15 minute charts for the most. Uh, you know, I might have an hourly here on the yens just so I can see a little bit more of it, and a 15 minute. And a 15 minute. Alright? And all I'm basically looking to see here is what's moving. You know, in our case, in our case, yes, they logged in and lots of euro dollar, you know, the flat line central. Pound sort of had, pound was rejecting 66 and kind of doing something, a grind to the downside like this. And the Aussie had come down, done a little base up, was trying to push up. And euro yen was messing around with 39.90, and the USD yen was making a double top at 103.50, and Euro Aussie was looking nothing but down. Okay, I absolutely do. Yep, and I'll I'll uh, get back to you on those in just a sec. Yes. All right. So <clears throat> all I'm trying to do here is find the active currency. Which one seems to be the mover and shaker for the day? Does that necessarily mean it's going to continue? No. No. But probably is the source of something, right? Why is the Aussie moving so much? Hmm. Okay, well, the emerging markets are all tanking. Maybe we should look at that. If that's the case, maybe if you want emerging market exposure, you're going to go to the Aussie. Yeah, I don't... Right, so one can start the thinking process, Okay. Just get the brain moving, get the wheels turning, all right? You know, in my case, um, I'll look at the correlation of things, and then I'll generally start my analysis with that sort of active currency. So it might be the Aussie if it was really moving, all right? And then I'll go from that onto Euro, okay? Or, and then once I'm done with the Euro, I'll look at, the dollar index, which is basically the reciprocal of the euro, is it not? You know, here's, here's a euro daily chart in front of you, and here's a dollar index chart. Yes, for the most part. I mean, I look at S&Ps and things. All right, so here is here's a dollar index chart, and it is the reciprocal, isn't it? You know, this 8075 was basically this 3650, and you can see what this level meant for the dollar index, and this is why we've been stuck there for the better part of the week, frustrating everybody. And if you look at that, 
in the same terms as the euro. The um, excuse me, 36.50 and the weekly central pivot basically provided the same level of support. Right, and that's all we are stuck there for three or four days. We've now subsequently broken it and making a little grind to the downside. Okay. Anyway, so the dollar index to me is a complementary source of information. I'm not sure necessarily that it is the entire means of information. I don't think it's my entirety of information, if that makes sense. In other words, I'm not going to look at the dollar index and make a decision on the Aussie, since I think the Aussie is like 5 or 10% of the dollar index. The DX is 60% euro. It's essentially the reciprocal of the euro dollar. So maybe you don't have a great plan on the dollar. Maybe the dollar index is maybe the dollar index is that information that you need. All right. So you can use those two charts. You can use this sort of reciprocal relationship for information. All right. Now, the other key, and I'll dive into more sort of what I'm looking for. Now, the other key thing that I like to look for is just something across the world that is significant. And what I mean by that is a piece of correlation, a longer-term daily chart hitting a key level of support um, or resistance for that matter. A, maybe it's a stochastic oscillation I'm watching on a four-hour chart. All right? I, you know what? I don't think – you know, if – here's – okay. I mean, if, say, the dollar index has broken a key level – then you're probably going to, and the euro is still lagging a little bit, you'll probably look for the euro to break the same level or to break a level of support that it's trying to break. So <clears throat> typically you're going to see the dollar index maybe lead the euro. I wouldn't say it as a rule. Like I said, you've got to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. You know? But the bottom line is, bottom line is in terms of structure, Look at what they've done the previous session. Find the currency that's moving things. Because even if, let's say, for instance, the Aussie was moving the previous session, it may not necessarily propel things moving forward, but you might then go and look at, say, the Euro Aussie, and say, well, hang on a minute, the Euro Aussie is now at massive support. So is that because the Aussie dollar has gained a ton of strength, or is that because the euro has been weak? And if that's the case, well, now we're at massive support, say, going into the London Open. Now we've got to ask ourselves the question, is the Aussie going to drop? Is the euro going to rise? What's the dollar going to do? Does this make sense? So if you, if you walk into the market and you notice, well, hey, euro pound, Euro pound is really sitting at, you know, it's sitting at 82.50. That is, you know, sitting at 82.50 here. That is very significant daily resistance if you go back to the 20th of, you know, around sort of the end of November. It's likely to drop. Is it likely to drop a ton? Probably not. You know, but... Is it likely to drop 30 pips looking at things? Sure. So starting the day, euro pound going to drop 30 pips. What does this mean? Does this mean necessarily that the euro is going to fall? Yeah, the correlations are all over the place. The correlations are dead. So it's a day by day, strong versus weak. And you've got to remember in this in this market, Everything's rubbish, right? Everything is toilet paper with the exception of Bitcoin. <laughs> All right? Everything's trash. I mean that, right? So <clears throat> I'll give you an example. I'm like, I'm right back to this euro pound. So we got, so everybody's saying, okay, well, it's QE infinity, right? This is the equity bubble. 
It's all artificial. The underlying economy fundamentals are still rubbish. The employment market is better because you've got baby boomers that are retiring. You've got um, you've got baby boomers retiring. You have um, uh, you have people that have literally stopped looking for work. The unemployed stopped looking for work. Therefore, the government considers them not well, not necessarily employed, but not unemployed, right? Because that's how we calculate. Unemployment figures here in the United States, right? You're not you're not unemployed in the United States if you don't have a job. You're unemployed in the United States if you're seeking unemployment benefits. So, if you're no longer seeking unemployment benefits, the U.S. government no longer considers you unemployed, right? So, <clears throat> if the employment market here is getting better. It's because McDonald's is hiring and people are no longer looking for work. It's not because QE is helping anything. QE is only just creating this equity bubble and putting money in 401k pockets. Right? That's all it's, that's all it's doing. Proven. Anyway, so my point is, yes, the underlying economy is rubbish. But is it more rubbish? Is it more rubbish than, Euro, than the euro? Is it more rubbish than the pound? Is it more rubbish than the Aussie? Right? Remember, currencies are traded relative. So even though we have the spin of the US economy is terrible, you've got to remember that is it more terrible than anything else? And this is the very difficult thing in trading at the moment. This is why correlations are all over the map. It's because that's the question. It's no longer, oh, is it the carry, is it the carry trade? Is it an unwinding of the carry trade? Because that's all that currency trading is, is where is yield going? That's all it is. And the anticipation of where yield is going. All right? So it's not that simple anymore. So you've got to look at, for today, what is stronger than, which currency is stronger than which, and for the week, which one is going to be stronger than which. All right? So I'll give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. All right? So let's say you walk into the market. Now you want to look at something, some instrument that makes sense. And you can boil it all, you can whittle the whole day down from there. Okay, so let's say, let's say that the euro pound, you've worked out very quickly by just scanning your top, is at resistance. And is likely to drop 40 pips, 30 pips. Does this does this mean that the euro dollar is likely to plummet for the day? Given just that information, no. Does it mean that the pound is going to skyrocket for the day? No. Does it even mean that, that the pound is going to go up for the day? Right, because if euro pound's going to head down, you're going to get pound. You're going to get pound stronger than the euro. That's all it is telling you. Okay, so all it's telling you here is, while I'm at the computer for the next two three hours, the euro is going to be weaker than the pound. We'll put a little red sort of spot over here. Pound a little bit stronger. So if I'm going to trade the dollar relative to the euro, and I expect dollar weakness, for instance, probably not going to trade the euro. It's probably going to be rubbish. If I'm going to trade, if I'm going to trade the dollar on the weak side, I'm probably going to pick the pound. If I'm going to trade it on the strong side, then yes, I want to short the euro. Okay, but we don't know anything about the dollar yet. But in the back of our mind, we're going, hey, the euro is likely to be weak. Does this make sense? So I'll give you another example. Yeah, you can you can really whittle the whole day down. All right, so I'll give you another example. Let's say, let's say tomorrow. You log in, yeah. You log in, yeah, and the. Euro Aussie is sitting somewhere down here, which I expect it to be. 
Okay, so your daily chart has done this. And it and that and then tomorrow you log in and Asia's kind of down here like this. Alright. This is very clearly an area of pretty good support. Does it mean it's gonna reverse itself and head up? No, because we turn in down here, this looks more like the move we have. But but a level like this, you're likely to see at least some reaction. Right? It's likely to retrace a bit of this candle at least within itself and it might push down at the end of the day. But for the London session, it's very likely that the Aussie is going to be stronger than the Euro. Okay, and now let's say, for instance, now let's say, for instance, the let's say, for instance, the euro pound is sitting right around sort of eighty-one fifty, which is slightly lower lows, but at support. So it's likely to hit up too. A little bit. I'm sorry, I got this backwards. Yeah. If we're going to bounce here, guys, it means that the euro is likely to be a little bit stronger than the Aussie. And then if you have euro pound, say, sitting around 81.50 or so, which is also support, it means that pound is likely to be a little weaker than the euro because we expect a little euro pound bounce. So we're getting immediate information here ahead of time. These bounces have not happened, but it's something you can anticipate by low sell high. But the euro is going to be that the euro is going to be the stronger currency for the day. One, what it does is it creates opportunities to flat, say, long the euro Aussie for a spot trade or long the euro pound for a spot trade. Or it's saying don't short them at these levels, right? You know, and then you'll look back and say, okay, well, I'd like to see it bounce back into this zone and then, you know, I can take it down to the next level, etc. It sets up different trade plans. But what it does is it gives you a look ahead view of what is likely to be strong versus weak based on daily support, daily resistance ahead of when ahead of when the market opens. Does this make sense? So you don't have to be a genius as far as as far as relative strength. Now if you look at it and everything's in the middle, right? It's not at a key level, well then you just you're gonna do a lot more sort of digging. Yeah? And guys, it's, I mean, it's so important what I'm trying to tell you here because you can, you can take that info and apply it to the market and, <clears throat> and be ahead of the game as far as relative strength. You know, so I'll give you another example. Beginning of the week, beginning of the week, Aussie Kiwi. Beginning of the week, Aussie Kiwi, for instance, is sitting here. I know, I know the Kiwi just said interest rate. I just said an interest rate announcement. <clears throat> but here we are sitting at this massive weekly double bottom. Does that mean necessarily that the Aussie Kiwi is not going to make lower lows. No, I expect it to. But is a bounce likely? Yes. A bounce is likely. So it, it tells you way ahead of the game, oh, well, I'm probably, if I'm going to, 
if I'm going to trade the Asian currencies on the strong side, I probably want to pick on Aussie. Okay. Now, let's project that further. All right. Let's say, let's say Friday we do something like this. Say, for instance, it goes up here, which you can see is level of resistance. Okay, that's going to push our little stochastic up like such. See how we now are like moving into the future? Like you're forcing your brain to, you may be wrong, you may be catastrophically wrong, but at least you're pushing your brain further as to what could be coming down the road. This is kind of our job is to predict the future, guys. So at least if it starts to look like you expect, then you can go trading. If it doesn't, well, then you're like, oh, well, I'm probably wrong and I need to wait until something else you recognize. Okay, so let's say we push up like this into this little resistance area. All right, what is, what, is like, what is typical of a candle that does that? So we'll go to the daily chart. All right, so, so we finish up today. And she looks like this. And then, so here's our resistance area. And that's not rocket surgery because, you know, you can see this. And... All right. So then what's typical of something like this is that it comes down initially. Do a little candle work like that. Traces a little bit. And then pushes up. That takes care of Thursday, Friday. All right. And let's say next week you log in and price is sitting up here to open Asia. That is your Sunday evening candle, early Monday morning Asia candle sitting right there. You know, we may be going to the next level of resistance. Who knows? But it's not likely that we're just going to roll right through the set, right through here like it's nothing. So chances are you're going to have something like this develop. Red, green, and then sort of more of a retracement before it bites its way up. So this gives us this gives us Monday. Actually, that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So. Right out the gate, because we have found a key level of resistance on a daily slash weekly chart, we know we know that the Monday candle is likely to sort of push up into the resistance. So in other words, Aussie and Kiwi are going to be awesome at it. Aussie and Kiwi are likely to be, for the most part, neutral. And then Tuesday, because we're reacting off that resistance and we poked our little nose above there, Aussie, Kiwi. The Kiwi is likely to be slightly stronger than the Aussie. And then, you know, for that Asia, we'll push down a little bit into the lows and pick up the support. So then for Wednesday, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I hope I haven't lost you all here. I hope kind of sticking with me in theory. So then Wednesday, it's likely that the Aussie is significantly stronger than the New Zealand dollar. Okay, significantly stronger. This is a big sort of reaction candle in the context of what is now, you know, pushing up. And then you're going to hit that resistance again and kind of taper off into Thursday, Friday, where you're likely to have more neutral here, neutral, neutral, and then it would be the other way around, I would expect. Pretty, thank you, Dave. It's very technical, but guys, you've got to, it, it's not an easy market. And this is, um, Chris Stevens used to call this reading the matrix, right? You've got to read the matrix. It's all there in front of you, but you have to be able to interpret. So I'll give you another example. So what is this telling us for the week? It's telling us neutral Aussie Kiwi Monday, probably bearish Aussie over Kiwi Tuesday. Doesn't necessarily mean we want to short the Aussie dollar. No, but if it's there for the taking and the dollar looks like it's going to be a dollar weekday, yes. Yes. 
then we want to get short the dollar, Aussie. The next day, if it's a dollar weakness day, in any event, you probably want to get long the Aussie. And if the yen looks like it's weak, the S&P looks like it's retracing, Aussie yen is going to be brilliant. Aussie kiwi is going to be good by itself. It's giving you potential trades based on daily spawn and resistance. Notice how, I'm, notice how I'm doing all these scenarios based off of key turning points in the market. Key turning points in the market. I have no interest in this. I have no interest in the zone. You can't really tell anything through there. It could go either way. All right? I'll give you another example. Um, I don't... But I typically have that stuff ingrained in the in the gray matter. You know, if I found something I like, I'll just I'll trade it to death for the week, basically. Yeah, because I'm. It's a little bit like you know, if you watch these Alaskan fishing shows, if fishing's hot in one area, the foolish captain is the one that packs up all his gear and goes, "Fishing's awesome here." But I know it's going to be awesome uh, three miles down the road. And then I'll pack everything up. I'll go three miles down the road and it's her- terrible. If fishing's good, yeah, just fish, yeah. Right? If it's not broken, don't even try to fix it. All right, I'll give you another example. Let's, um, <clears throat> you know, gold. I was asked a question about gold earlier on. If you're looking for gold currency correlation, probably going to be disappointed. If you're looking to trade gold by itself, you're probably going to be okay. The other other little top tip I have maybe on gold is this. You guys have been a little bit all over the map today, but I'm trying to. Um, this is something you probably want to take note of on gold. It's only sort of a decade-long trend line that I do not expect to be broken. So, something like this, like a $300 trade, to me, looks pretty reasonable. And then I guess we could do anything here. Even do kind of something like that. Just range for the next four years. But this 11, 20 to 10, 50 zone in my very humble opinion, is going to be worth 400 bucks. And I've been talking about nat gas for about two years, and it finally, finally did what it's supposed to be, double in value. Okay. So let's let's bring up another few examples of what I'm talking about. Let's have a look at the euro dollar, since we all trade this. All right. Now let's look at the dollar index and discuss a few things. Right. There's a couple of scary things. If you're a dollar bull like me, right, if you're a dollar bovine like I am, there's a couple of things on this little weekly dollar index chart that are fairly scary. Right? How many of you are looking at this? How many of you are looking at this here and saying, well, that's a nice little drop, and this is a continuation flag, and we're going to do this? How many of you are looking at that scenario? In which case, your time to shine is coming up. Okay, maybe I'll adjust that a little bit. How many of you are potentially looking at this? Something like that. Um, 
you know, John, I've been doing almost everything ex- exclusively with just entry orders. So if I like a level, I typically just put in a trade and uh, walk away. Everything is so, everything is so new sensitive. Uh, it, you know, the same sort of natural, or I could use the word organic. It makes me want to puke in my mouth. The same sort of normal flow of things isn't quite what it used to be. So if I like a level, I'll typically just put an order there and close my eyes. And to be honest, I haven't even been trading with stops. Just because I don't, I'm almost, I'm technical, but very, I'm sort of 60% fundamental. You know? And I, I look at a euro pound, I'll come right back to the dollar index. Um, you know, I look at euro pound, and I realize we're coming off this weekly support. And, you know, the one thing I've been watching is the, Obviously, this is a sort of trap. But this doesn't look bullish. And I'm, I'm, it's a monthly chart, I know, which is crazy for most. But I don't see anything here that's making me very bullish, necessarily. You know, this, to me, is looking more like this. Something like that as it picks up this level. You know, if it was going to rise, it would have... Down so here, the, the little double bottom, and done something more like this, but it's not. So you know, I'm looking at this, expecting. I realize this is support. I'm certainly not ignoring it. We bounced here a long time, and I know it's a monthly chart. So you got to kind of, you know, you got to go into a really long term zone. But I, I could see something like this, the better thing. Basically, it takes care of the better part of 2014. So, yeah, I'm a euro pound bear. This is saying short six months. You know, now, does that necessarily mean that 8260 is the key entry? No, I don't think so. Because if you look at, you know, here's a weekly chart, you'd like to do kind of something like this. This will have its day in, this will have its day in court. So you're going to, you know, do this kind of thing again. It'll look clean on the on the monthly, but I mean, here's a weekly chart, but that's the sort of thing I'm expecting. <clears throat> Overall, I think the UK is going to recover much quicker than the euro. I think that the euro is in denial. All right, anyway, that's my two cents on that. Let's go back to let's go back to this dollar index chart, if I may. I'll just close that. There it is. Okay, so here's the dollar index chart. So nobody is nobody is looking at this scary little scenario for dollar bulls. Nobody at that as far as that. That is one scenario that I've been looking at, and I don't particularly care for that being a guy that short euro to the T. Because if this started to break down, this starts to break this stuff. I mean, hello, we are coasting to 76, and it's going to happen quickly, and, you know, that's going to be 148. I can't believe that. But anyway, you know, everything is believable. In my humble opinion, in my very humble opinion, I'm looking more at this as the range and price is likely to be going more towards here, 83.40. That equates to, I don't know, late 32s on the euro, you know, at that point, what are we going to do? Ping pong a little bit and figure it out? I'm thinking more like this. And we sort of slip into the wider range. Makes sense? I've got a lot of lines on the chart now, but that's kind of what I'm looking at. But I guess what I'm saying, though, is the following. If we log in on Monday 
and we're sitting, say, here. Okay, we are sitting at 8180. I'm just looking at, I'm looking at scenarios and situations that we could possibly see for ourselves. So we are sitting there. Okay, and this sort of stochastic has done this. Very bullish. <clears throat> Guys, I don't print, I'll do a lesson next time on oscillator use. I don't care if it's crossing here necessarily. Because these cross and uncross. I care when it's like this in the trading zone like that. That to me is more significant. And this crossing up in the trading zone pointing up when the direction of the stochastic is up to me is more bullish than and bearish. All right. But let's say we are sitting here at 8170, which we know is resistant. Okay. It's likely then that, yeah, we could anticipate next week that we're going to see a candle like this. How is that likely to be created? All right. Let's go to the, let's go to the data here. Okay. So let's think about this. Right, you can have people look at this trend line. So let's say this is Thursday, Friday. We open Friday and we're kind of lurking up here, which is probably somewhere around 34.50 on the euro, 34.60. Is it likely to just blast right through there? No, it's probably not, is it? Probably then going to retrace off this level and come back and test this stuff here. Right, green zone. So if you look on Monday, and we are parked somewhere around sort of 8170, 8180 mark, you're likely to see some dollar strength. So it's very likely you're going to have a currency trade that takes you from, say, 3440, 3450 on the euro, Back to 35.50, 35.60, maybe even an overshoot back to 35.70. But then, as is typical with currency, it's going to retest that spot. It's going to go, oh, okay, we'll have another look there. So then you, you're going to flip your position from 35.60, and you're going to short it down to the daily turn of MA right back to 34.40 again. So next week, you like to. Now, this is assuming that we're at these levels come Monday. And notice I'm only talking about them at the turning point, not in the middle. So I have no interest in a trade at 35. I have no interest in a trade at 34.80. I'm interested at 34.60. I'm interested at 34.40. I'm interested at 34.50. Why? Because these are key turning points of these things. Okay, I'm interested when the dollar index is retesting 81.20. I'm interested when it's testing 8170. I've no interest in it when it's at 8150. I've no interest in it when it's at 8160. That is in the middle. Make sense? <clears throat> so next week, you'd like to have a trade that you long from 3440 and you short at 3560, both for 100 pips. Based on dollar index correlation, a little bit of dollar, a little bit of euro dollar, basic analysis, and then some euro pound stuff if it fits. I've also been watching the Swiss Eagle correlation. Does this make sense, guys? And this is just part of the daily routine for me, is news. What news is coming up? Getting a fundamental sort of basis for my thinking. Then looking at what is the mover and shaker for the day. Having a look at that currency, having a look at crosses of that currency. Euro Aussie, Aussie, Kiwi, then looking more at the dollar index. Maybe the euro is the mover, in which case I want to look at the DX primarily, and the euro dollar primarily, and the euro pound. If they don't give me any clues, then I'll start to look maybe at the yens. Where is the USDN? Oh, okay. 103 is tough. Is it going to take it down to 101.50? Let me have a look at that. But when you go through your charts, make sure that you're doing the following. Simply mark down, simply mark down what is going to be, and I'll wrap it up in a sec, what is going to be your major turning point. So this would be obviously support 
It is coming off a lower high, so I wouldn't necessarily expect it to hold. But it bounced there, sure. But where's the next level? Well, this looks important. Oh, well, hang on. We were just talking about that for a long. Okay, this looks important. It's below it, so you put red. Okay, and obviously you got some minor stuff here. But if you were going to take, if you were getting price action basing out in here, on the bar side, you pretty long it to here, spot trade. Because it's rolling down, you got a lower high, and it's looking like this. Anything to that point, you're going to try and hold a little more. Let's say it's down here, you're going to try and take it back to the, sort of this red zone, and then short it down again. Great, you've got one trade, two, and then once it's here, you just sort of question mark it, figure it out. Make sense? So when price hits these different levels, you're like, huh. Even though it looks as bearish as can be at 34.30, it's probably not going to rip right through there. And you can build an entire day's trading around that one piece of information. Because it's going to disseminate information to the pound too. Like, oh, well, the euro is at massive support. That's going to push the euro pound up probably. Is it worth looking to sell the pound? Then you can look at a pound chart and say, oh, yeah, that looks reasonable. Okay. So in this very tricky market, and I'm not going to pretend it's not, try to find one or two cross-correlated things, whether that's the dollar index, euro pound, euro Aussie, the base currencies themselves, one or two key pieces of information, key turning points, and then kind of drop everything down from there. Okay, if you have any questions, at Forex David on the Twit. Um, <clears throat> I'm no longer with FX Bootcamp, guys, but always available on the Twit. Okay, thanks, folks. I hope you learned a little something, something, and we will catch up with you. I think the next go-around for me, like you are saying, is on the 27th. And maybe we'll do um, some oscillator work. Okay. Thanks, guys. And we'll talk to you soon. Good luck, Philip.